send me an email I'll put them up there yeah yeah uh, spinal anatomy it's week seven really it's Wednesday here we go um, this is where we left off enzymes some important enzymes of the intervertebral disc specifically the MMPs the matrix metallo proteases we need to learn a couple of these three of them to be exact what do they do well the disc isn't very good at repairing major damage like it has no way to repair tears in type 1 collagen but it can repair type 2 collagen injury proteoglycan injury so it can fix itself a little bit it's not perfect but it, it helps and there's three enzymes that are important for uh, cleaning up damage like if you're weightlifting you're going to damage a little bit of you're going to kill some proteoglycans off and maybe rip up some type 2 collagen uh, but you can you can fix that so here they are uh, of course they're not going to make it easy they're not on boards they won't call them MMP 1 2 and 3 they're going to call them collagenase gelatinase and stromalysin so make sure you know those terms and we'll see what uh, what they they all do okay collagenase that's MMP1 uh, they cut type 2 collagen into giant fragments the fragments are still too big to be eaten by macrophage so you still can't get rid of them uh, but then gelatinase comes in and cuts the type 2 collagen into smaller fragments uh, small enough where macrophage can eat them and get rid of them um, so they can be cleaned up the important one though is this one uh, stromalysin MMP type 3 um, this is very good at cleaning up just about everything except type 1 collagen um, so it's, uh, it's it can be very aggressive but it's controlled as we will see and it can eat proteoglycans, type 2 collagen, type 9, type 7. Uh, just about any type of collagen it can eat up, get rid of, except type 1 collagen. Uh, and fibronectin as well. So very uh, useful at cleaning up damaged tissue. But it's very aggressive. So uh, you don't want this thing running wild in your, your disc. Uh, some believe that this stromalysin running wild in your disc uncontrolled is maybe a cause of premature degenerative disc disease. Some theories about that. Normally the MMPs are they're created by the nucleus propulsa cells and annulus fibrosa cells, but they're created in an inactive form. So you need a molecule to wake them up. It's kind of a double fail-safe. Like I don't know if you know the enzymes of the pancreas yet. Very powerful proteolytic enzymes. They can eat a hole right through your body, but they're created in the pancreas in an inactive form, so they're harmless. They have to be activated. Um, same with pepsin. Pepsinogen of the stomach is created in an active form called pepsinogen, and that has to be woken up. Same kind of deal here. Stromalysin is inactive until it's woken up. And who wakes it up is a molecule called plasmin. So plasmin is when you have damage inside the disc tissue, plasmin is released, and then stromalysin, the little tail of the molecule, is cut off and it becomes active. Also similar to how renin activates angiotensinogen. Who knows angiotensinogen and renin? Some of you have a little inkling of that. You're going to have to really know that system good. We'll hit that one. Dr. Doe gets it. I get it again in fifth quarter. We really get into the weeds on it. But same kind of deal. Renin kind of starts that whole chain. All right. So great. MMPs are cleaning up an injury. Maybe you squatted heavy and they have to be released to clean up some mess. But then you have to turn them off. And this is where the problem comes in, especially with stromalysin. Sometimes it doesn't like to be turned off. And there are some turner offer enzymes called the tissue inhibitors of met metalloproteases, or the TIMPs. TIMP1, TIMP2, and stromalysins is TIMP3. Uh, and these inactivate these enzymes, because once the job is done, once the damaged disc is fixed, 
You don't want it to keep eating things because it'll start eating good tissue and it'll destroy your disc. Um, so the temps are the ones. So, oh, did I take, I guess I took all the pathology out. Lucky you. <laughs> but can you imagine what would happen? Some of the theories about degenerative disc disease is you have a gene mutation where you make a temp 3 that doesn't work very good. Uh, therefore, if stromalysin was turned loose, it's not going to be shut off in time, and it stays active too long. Uh, so mutations in these genes are thought to possibly play a role in why some young people get really bad degenerative disc disease. I really went into the weeds. I guess I took that out last quarter. It might be getting too deep. but um, So these are the Turner offers. But imagine gene mutations, uh, stromalysin running wild, destroying your disc. Not a good thing. All right, some easier sledding now. Posterior longitude and ligament. Getting into the ligaments. Uh, you know the stuff already. Um, maybe some of the details you don't know. There it is. We know what it looks like here. Um, it's more narrow in the lumbar spine. As you go up to the cervical spine, it gets thicker and or broader and broader and broader. The anterior longitudinal ligament in the lumbar spine is very wide. And as you go up and up, it gets more narrow and more narrow. Just the opposite. So that's classic board type questions. I think I've said that before. But the PLL covers the vertebral bodies, uh, specifically the posterior annulus. It lends a little support to the annulus, prevents central disc herniations from occurring. Uh, some fun facts, it's three to four times thicker in the cervical spine compared to the thoracic and lumbar spine, so it gets quite thin in the lumbar spine in addition to getting quite narrow. There are some lateral fibers that kind of help, be, help it because it's getting so narrow. The committee designed some little extension fibers that go out laterally, kind of see them here. That's, this is a more accurate representation of what it really looks like. Although they get microscopic, it's kind of hard to see them. The ones in the middle are thick, look like a thick band. But you do have these lateral attachments that maybe lend a little support to the posterior lateral regions of the disc. It's said to give it a classic serrated look. I never can really see that, but serrated. Does that look serrated to you? Like jagged? I don't know. Not very exciting. Um, just exactly like the anterior longitudinal ligament, there's actually four distinct bands of fiber that make up this ligament. So it's not this straight little ligament that authors sometimes draw. And if you really get into the histology of it, uh, the, some bands span one motion segment, so they connect into this vertebrae to this vertebrae. Others go much higher, others go much higher, and then there's even one that spans five segments. So it's actually kind of the take-home message is quite a complicated ligament. It has many different sets of fibers running within it, which gives it, helps give it a little bit of strength. There is a name change. This will make more sense when we get up to the cervical spine. But another easy softball board question. Posterior longitudinal ligament does not run all the way up to the skull, to the foramen magnum. Um, the anterior longitudinal ligament does. It runs all the way up from the sacrum all the way up to the, uh, to the foramen magnum, which is that hole in the bottom of the skull, but not the PLL. Uh, specifically, at about the level of C2, uh, the PLL stops, and a new histological appearance occurs, an even thinner appearance occurs, uh, and it's so thin that you really can't call it a ligament anymore. It's called the tectoral membrane. Tectoral membrane. So the tectoral membrane is an extension of the posterior longitudinal ligament uh, and that's the thing that actually connects to the skull or the foramen magnum. Okay, so real easy, basic stuff there. Okay, um, if you go inferiorly, it morphs into our friend, remember the deep dorsal sacrococcygeal ligament. So it is a continuation, or the, the, dor the deep dorsal sacrococcygeal ligament is really just a continuation of the posterior longitudinal ligament, which happens inside the sacrum in the sacral canal. 
Okay. And yet another weakness. Do you remember the weaknesses why disc herniations kind of happen in that paracentral zone? Remember the last lecture? We said the lamellae, some of them are complete circles, but a lot of them are incomplete in the posterior lateral corners. And then a lot of lamellae are thin in the posterior lateral corners compared to the anterior. And here's another weird thing. So this is a third factor that leads to these posterior lateral disc herniations. Let's get, look at a picture. So these little side fibers, they cover the bottom part, of the superior end plate here is covered, but there's a little crack right up here at the top where there is no covering at all to the posterior lateral region of the disc. So mo most herniations, they tend to start right in this little, little triangle, this weak spot. Uh, and why the committee designed it like this, I have no idea. Uh, but the herniation squirts out here and then it rips through the PLL here and you get yourself a posterior lateral herniation uh, in the paracentral zone, which is by far, the most, you're going to run into hundreds, maybe thousands of these things in treating patients over your career. And this little window is not, not a great design. So that's yet the third weakness. I can see the question already. Which one of the following is not one of the, the inherent weaknesses of the, uh, that, gives, that gives rise to a posterior lateral disc herniation? And then we got the lamellae are incomplete. Yeah, that's true. The lamellae are thin in the posterior lateral. That's true. There's a little window in the superior corner on the inferior vertebral end plate where there's no ligament, no posterior longitudinal ligament is covering, that's true. And I could say something crazy, and hopefully you'll get it right. Um, just to remind you, here's a take home forever slide. For the rest of your chiropractic careers, you will need this slide. Even if you don't read your own MRIs, you're going to be reading radiology reports, and they use it's useful to know where the herniation is. So these are the zones that describe where disc herniation is. We have a central zone here, and just this is a CT myelogram. This is the fecal sac filled up with contrast. There's the S1 roots. There's an S, uh, another S1 root here. Um, and here's the zones. We have a central zone in the middle. This is the zone where most herniations occur, called the, some call it the subarticular zone. It's more in Europe, but I've seen radiologists use it here. We usually call it just the paracentral, meaning cent central para means next to, so kind of next to the central zone. And then we have a zone inside the intervertebral foramen, just called the foraminal, the foraminal zone. And then we have a zone outside, kind of lateral to the foramen, called the far lateral zone or the extraforaminal zone. So make sure you know this. This will serve you well all the way through school and beyond. Question? What is the, the pink zone That is the zone where most herniations occur. That's the paracentral oh. zone. Yeah, it's right up at the top, mm -hmm. aka subarticular zone. You said that was the most common. By far the most common. This is the posterior lateral region of the disc right here. And those three weaknesses lend or allow most herniations to occur right into this spot. All right, so let's do a case. Cases are fun. 44 year old comes into your practice with foot drop, left foot. What is foot drop? Have you heard of that before? Have you seen, anybody seen that before? Anybody have that? Ooh. Yeah, you will definitely see that. I got a couple of YouTube videos on it. They can't, you know, when you walk, I guess you can't see my feet, but when you walk, you have to be able to cock your feet out of the way, right? If they don't, if you can't cock your foot out of the way, it's going to trip. You're going to trip on the ground. That's foot drop. Your dorsiflexors are broken. Um, that is foot drop. Some call it drop foot. I like foot drop, it's better. So he's having trouble walking. They, they, pick, they have to pick their leg leg up like this. Otherwise, they'll trip over. Um, so you'll see this. So he comes in with foot drop. Um, the, your brain should immediately think L4 nerve root, L3 disc herniation, uh, or a far lateral or foraminal L3 disc herniation. 
uh, that's, your brain hit, should know these things, and I don't expect you to know that now, but uh, you, you, you will pretty soon. So you're thinking, oh, there's a problem with the L4 nerve root somewhere. Um, and so uh, you do a neurological examination, there is some weakness in the, the dorsiflexors, tibialis anterior is an easy one, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Uh, the patient can't walk on his heels. That's a good one. Have the patient walk on their heels. If you're lazy, you don't want to do a full test. I always do this when I consult with people on the weekends. I turn the camera on and say, walk on your heels. Walk on your toes is S1. Walk on your heels is L4. Uh, and then take a stick, like a broomstick, and lift your big toe to the air and push down on your big toe. What, what nerve is that? What muscle is that? Big toe razor. Extensor hallucis longus, great muscle to test, almost pure L5. Probably 90% of humans have a, a single L5 nerve innovation. So you can test S1 by the calf, extensor hallucis by the 5, uh, and L4 is the dorsiflexors, Tom, Dick, and Harry. Um, so he had quite a bit of weakness. Um, you start flexion distraction treatment. I wouldn't recommend. I've talked about spinal manipulation. There's no need to crack him, I don't think, but you can certainly try to do flexion distraction treatment. Um, you got an MRI because you weren't happy. This has been going on for a while. Four months. You should have had an MRI probably at six weeks. So what do you think? What do you see? I've shown you a couple. I haven't showed you one like this, though. Yeah, we're here. Here? Yeah, that's poking straight out. So the magic word is herniation. Don't ever call this a bulge unless you work for the insurance company. Uh, that's like disc herniation, $80,000 settlement. Disc bulge, zero. So radiologists who kind of tend to work for insurance companies, they like to use that word bulge because the research goes 80% of people have bulge over the age of 40, but not 80% have a disc herniation. And specifically, this is a bad type of herniation because of its location. Uh, it's a far lateral herniation. And what lives out in the far lateral zone? The dorsal root ganglia, kind of the brain of the nerve. It does not like to be crushed. And that's what the problem was. This is a cut line right here. We put a cut right through this axial view, and we can look on the sagittal view here, and we can see there it is, right in the foramen. Here's the neural foramen of L5-S1. There's the nerve, and here's L4. That's the L4 exiting nerve root. That makes perfect sense, right? He's got an L4 nerve problem. There's a herniation kind of smashing the bottom of that nerve, um, and that was the problem. He needed a discectomy. He failed all conservative care, got to do something, can't lose his house. Um, and so that's an example of a far lateral herniation. Okay. Everything I said. Question. Question. Um, so for, for these patients, there's no treatment when it comes to the nerve. It's more like cross-cracking or flattening the nerve to let you know, like, up to like walk. Yep. Yep. That's it. And the Typically, these, the foot drop will come back. Um, you have about four months to play around with these patients since the time the foot drop. You better get a surgical consult uh, with a spine surgeon. It may take four or five months to get in to see a good spine surgeon. So get that set up, but work on them. Work on them strength. You can do flexion distraction treatment. Probably 80% of them will get better without any type of surgery. Uh, part In part due to your treatment, maybe the flexion distraction will help kind of encourage the process of inflammation, but the inflammation can completely, I've seen these things completely disappear within a couple months and surgery's canceled. Sometimes they get better, sometimes they don't, especially the ones that take maybe eight months, a year, uh, and then they finally disappear, but the patient, I talked to two patients last month, the exact scenario, their surgeries were canceled, but they still had horrible leg pain. They didn't understand what happened. Well, the nerve root got damaged, permanently damaged from the herniation. They waited too long to have the surgery. Uh, but these will disappear. This one doesn't look like it'll disappear because it's pure black. Um, there's no whiteness. White is inflammation. Uh, if I would see some white color in here, I would know that inflammation is starting, and that's a good sign for reabsorption.
Okay. All right, what does the PLL do? Well, it reinforces that kind of danger zone for herniations, for one thing. That's good. It is one of the intervertebral ligaments that we talked about, the ALL, the PLL. Do you remember the third one? Starts with an S, not ligamentum flavum. Sharpie's fibers. Sharpie's fibers are the other uh, intervertebral ligament. ALL, PLL, Sharpie's fibers. Um, so it's one of the three that helps hold the motion segment together. Um, it's said to resist uh, resist forward flexion, so that makes sense. Uh, if you bend forward, it's going to pull this thing tight, so it helps resist that a little bit. Uh, some uh, no, that's ligament inflate. It, this is just a resistor. Anterior longitudinal ligament, pretty much the same, only a little bit backwards. So in the lumbar spine, it's very wide and broad. It gets more narrow as you go upward. Uh, we said this one goes all the way up to the foramen magnum. There's no extensions, there's no lateral extensions on this one in the lumbar spine like there is the PLL. Uh, it's just a straight, thin ligament. It still has uh, those many bands of fibers, uh, four or five bands. This one has four bands uh, uh, that extend upwards. So that's there's the little, I guess I don't teach embryology anymore, but students used to hate when that little man showed up because that's when we would talk about some uh, some biochemistry and crazy stuff. That's the little watch out guy. Uh, but there's four different types of fibers here. I don't think I'm going to ask a question about that. But you should know it's a multi-fibrous ligament. It's, it's a complex ligament. Uh, let's see. They anchor into the periosteum as well. Um, they don't anchor into the disc though, like the posterior longitudinal ligaments. They anchor and are woven right into the annulus fibrosis. Uh, the PLL is more into the periosteum and it doesn't really anchor into the disc that much. It again runs all the way up to the skull or the occiput is kind of the bottom part of the bone. Uh, what does it do? Well, it's one of the intervertebral ligaments so it holds the motion segment together. Uh, it's going to resist extension more. If you extend backwards, the ALL is going to be pulled tight. And we'll expand on that because there is an injury that occurs on that thing. Uh, so clinically, uh, it mainly engages during extension type motions. Uh, it might help stabilize the, because it goes all the way to the skull, it might help stabilize the cervical spine a little bit. The cervical spine doesn't have any ribs. They're tiny little bones. Whiplash. You're going to treat thousands of these cases over your career as well. So whiplash, the guy's sitting at his car, not really looking around, and some person comes, smashes right into the back of him. Uh, that is a rear-end collision. No matter what the person says, the deer ran in the road, my brakes ran out, the sun was in my eyes, they're at fault. These are really good personal injury cases. The guy who hit, when you hit some from behind, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if he purposely slams on the brakes and wants to get hit, you're still responsible. But in this case, he's not paying attention. When the force hits the back like that, the body goes forward, but the little head on the pole with no stabilization gets whipped backwards, hits the headrest, and then goes forward. And that's why it's called whiplash. But when it goes backwards, the anterior longitudinal ligament suddenly tightens probably too much, especially if you don't have a headrest. And it can actually damage the spine, as we'll see here in a second. Let's take a look at this. Another case. 38-year-old comes into your practice complaining of cervical spine pain following a rear end, what's an MVA? Motor vehicle. motor vehicle accident. Occurred six weeks ago and he's just coming in. Uh, no x-rays, hasn't been to the hospital. My neck hurts. I thought it'd get better. You'll hear this a million times. Oh, the, the emergency department's too expensive. I thought it'd get better. Be careful with these patients. You gotta do an x-ray on somebody like that can monkey around a week or so, two weeks after MVA if they pass all your tests, but six weeks and they still have pain, you better get an extra before you touch them. 
and it's a good thing they did get an x-ray in this case. What do you think? They did get an x-ray. So this is a side view of the bones. We haven't covered them, but their cervicals is just like the lumbar. There's the vertebral bodies. What do you think? Well, I guess there's a big arrow pointing. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> Forgot to take off the arrow. What do you think? What's that? That's a fracture. L the anterior longitudinal ligament connects to those corners very strongly. When their head went back like that, the ligament was stronger than the bone and it actually ripped the bone right off. That's called, what is that called? Anybody know? Avulsion fracture. That's an avulsion fracture. And you will see maybe not hundreds of those things, but you'll definitely run into a couple of those. There is a, an embryologic condition where they fail to fuse. There's growth centers in these corners and it should turn to bone. Some of them never fuse and it can look just like a fracture. That's called a persistent epithesis. And you will get that one. So that's a differential diagnosis. And I forgot last quarter, sometimes I forget you're only in first quarter. What does a differential diagnosis even mean? What's a primary diagnosis? Pri yeah, a pr so you do an exam, you take x-rays, uh, and you turn on your noodle and you think, what's the matter with this person? Okay, it's a, well, based on the x-ray, it's an avulsion fracture. That's your primary diagnosis. But there might be secondary diagnoses. Those are called differential diagnosis. So the differential diagnosis, well, maybe it's a persistent epithesis. Um, so a differential diagnosis is like a second string or a third string or fourth string diagnosis. And some conditions, uh, like when someone has ankylosing spondylitis, it's, you can have quite a list of differential diagnoses. So primary diagnosis, a differential is like a second, third, fourth string. All right, some other problems that can happen. Um, and we talked about one problem with this anterior longitudinal ligament already. Uh, and that was uh, ankylosing spondylitis. That's one of the seronegative spondylarthropathies. Uh, where the anterior longitudinal ligament can inflame and calcify bamboo spine, a very thin calcification. But there's another condition that hits the anterior longitudinal ligament called DISH, diffuse, idiopathic, skeletal, hyperostosis. That's a mouthful, DISH. Um, and we don't know what causes it. Sometimes it's associated with trauma. But this is not a bamboo spine. This is a crazy, th insane thickening of the anterior longitudinal ligament. For example, look at this patient. They got a massive thickening on the front of the spine. All those little square bones don't look like little squares anymore. They got all this thickness. And then they got this gigantic bone spur coming out here. Uh, and it's pushing kind of right into... Uh, let's see, this is air, so that's the esophagus right here. This is the nasal cavity here. This is the, the oral pharynx and the oral cavity. Uh, this is the laryngo down here. So it's right kind of at, at the bottom of the oral cavity. Uh, we have a gigantic spur. What do you think is going to happen when they try to swallow a big piece of chewed up meat or a big hamburger? They're going to have trouble. They might even have pain. They're going to have trouble swallowing. There's a word for that. That's called dysphagia. Dysphagia. So some people who have trouble swallowing, we'll talk about the other causes in fifth quarter, uh, but it could be dish. It could be a problem with the spine that caused that. Do you guys know what the EOP is yet? External occipital protuberance? That bump right in the back of your head? Some of you have a little one. Some of you have a big one. Look at this one. You'll appreciate this more next quarter. That's like ridiculous, like a golf ball. Uh, so sometimes other things can calcify as well. But if you have palpation next quarter, you'll be you'll be finding that thing. Um, if the if it was down here where the larynx is, the voice box, uh, you could have dysphonia. That's trouble speaking. Dysphonia. So make sure you know those those words. Uh, DISH, also known as Forestier's disease, we don't know what causes it. Uh, it may be associated with, uh, with trauma. 
it loves the anterior longitudinal ligament. There are some differential diagnoses. One of is ankylosing spondylitis. Sometimes osteoarthritis can look like this, usually not in multiple levels like this. Usually it's a flowing calcification like that. That's not ankylosing spondylitis. That's dish when it's huge, visible. Uh, it's not like a thin line, like a bamboo spine. Uh, physiology, we don't, we don't really know why it happens. Uh, it shows up not in people your age, though. It usually starts in the 50s and progresses as they get older. Uh, it hits men way more than women. About 19% of men are affected compared to 4% of, of women. Um, other risks, like other injuries, are a risk factor we said already. Uh, it's thought, it's theorized that maybe there's an injury to the spine that predated it and you have some instability of the spine and it's the body's attempt to stabilize the spine is one theory. I'm not sure if I buy that theory, but um, that's one. Here's another person who had dysphagia. There's the epiglottis right there, so the voice box is right here. So that's a pretty thick bone right there. They have trouble swallowing as well. Question? Is the dish limited to just the cervical spine? Uh, it shows up more in the cervical, but it can certainly go down in the thoracic and even the lumbar. But it tends to show up more in the cervical spine. So how do you even fix that? Then? You don't fix it. If it gets if it gets big where they have dysphagia, you have to go in surgically and scrape it out and move it out of there. So yeah, this is not anything that we can do. Good question though. Symptoms. Most of the time the patient comes in and you they're, ah, they're old, their neck's a little stiff. You take an x-ray and you see that. It, so they didn't even know they had it. They just had a little stiffness. Most of the time it's asymptomatic. Uh, maybe a little stiffness, but they don't really think much about it. And we already said uh, trouble swallowing is dysphagia. Trouble speaking is dysphonia. If they have flat out pain, they're probably not gonna have pain unless they've waited too long, but I guess you should know that. So dysphagia is trouble swallowing it's not really go to the hospital type of pain but go to the hospital type of pain is called odynophagia odynophagia is another is a painful flat out painful swallowing just trouble swallowing irritation is dysphagia the difference between those two all right uh, let's go back to ligamentum flavum we know a little bit about this one already it's called the yellow ligament um, it's uh, connected to the lamina, kind of forms the roof of the vertebral canal, you could say. Um, and it's yellow because, histologically speaking, it has a lot of elastin in it. Uh, elastic fibers have ability to recoil and snap back, which makes this ligament unique. In fact, there's so much elastin in it, it really gives it a yellow look and a fresh cadaver. Um, it joins the motion segments together. It's usually about two millimeters thick. It can get crazy thick in humans. We'll see an example. I, some, I'm not sure if we see that today, but I'll definitely show you some examples of, I might have even already showed you it. It's so, I see it almost every other week I'll see it. It's so, so common. Um, it's said to be a paired structure, so there's a right and left even though most of the times they're kind of blended together in the cadaver, it's kind of hard to see the difference of them. Uh, they are found between C1, C2, and L5 and S1. They are not, here's the question where I'll see if you know this or not. They're not found between C1 and, and the skull, C1 and occiput. Um, there's another ligament in place of that. We'll look at that more in a sec. You could say that they form the roof of the vertebral canal. Remember, here's that view where the vertebral body has been removed. You've cut the pedicles, pulled the vertebral body right off, and you can see ligament of flavor. You've taken off the spinal cord and all this stuff. There's ligament of flavor. So it forms the roof, the real roof of the vertebral canal. Lamina are right deep to it. But here's the, here's the board question. Here's my question. So it doesn't go all the way to the top. It stops in the posterior arch of C1. So the last ligamentum flava lives between C1 and C2. That's the last of it. 
There is another ligament that lives in place of it, but it's thinner and it's broader, so you can't really call it ligamentum flavum, even though it's, it's pretty much the same thing. Just histologically, it's got thinner. This is an important one. It's called the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. Why is, who cares about this one? This thing, vertebral artery, very important artery. It's one of the only, there's only two blood supplies to your noodle, to the brain, and this is one of them. Notice how it pierces the posterior atlanto-occipital membrane. We'll look at a structure which I guarantee you one, at least probably two of you in this class have this. It's called a posterior ponticle. For some reason, this, where it pierces the ligament here, this region likes to turn to bone. And there's a little controversy about doing grade five manipulation, which is the crack, classical crack with the manipulation. There's a little controversy. We weren't allowed to do it when we went to school, but I think you are now. But there's a little controversy about this, this delicate artery being surrounded by hard bone and then you twisting on their neck. So we'll look at that more when we get, get up higher. Uh, but anyway, that's the PLL. In fact, we'll see a posterior ponticle in lab. I actually have one, a real one you can look at. Uh, in the lumbar spine, of course, it's right there. There's ligamentum flavum in black right here. And you could say it's found posterior to the thecal sac. That's true. Or posterior to the spinal cord. Or posterior to the quad equina. Yeah, it's right there. It's in front of the lamina, though. Right, here's the lamina, so this way's front, so it's anterior to the lamina. Okay, really seen nicely on MRI. You cannot see it on x-ray at all. It's weird the way it's anchored. Let's look at the picture. So it's not anchored evenly. The top fibers of it are actually anchored to the anterior part of the lamina. So you could say that the anterior fibers are actually inside the spinal canal. The inferior, or the superior fibers, the inferior fibers are located on the posterior part of the lamma. So these are actually outside of the spinal canal. So what a weird design. Uh, but that's, that's the way it is. Uh, we said histologically it's made up of 80% elastin, 20% collagen. Um, at the very end of this ligament where the attachments are, there's another tissue called alunin, uh, which has a tr tremendous ability to recoil, kind of like a slinky, uh, even more so than the elastin. Elastin is stretchy too, but this can actually recoil. Uh, so the ligament does have the ability to recoil. Here's a pretty fresh cadaver. It's kind of hard to see it, but all this yellow, that's ligamentum flavum. Classic function of ligamentum flavum, according to Bogduke, and Kramer would agree, I think, is because of its ability to coil, uh, it is said to help you to come up from a flex position. So if you bend over and touch your toes as you come up, it's recoiling. It doesn't have much power, maybe 0.5%, but it might help a little bit. More importantly, because of its ability to recoil, it, it stays out of the way. So it's not going to poke into the posterior thecal sac when you're bending forward or when you're bending backward normally. And trouble can occur when this buckling phenomena occurs. Kramer says the most important function is to prevent buckling into the vertebral canal during extension. Really old research. I'm not sure if that's really true. Um, but that's what Kramer says. That's a board book, so it could be on the boards. Um, I don't personally think that's the problem with it. The problem with it is when it gets super, super big and it crushes the thecal sac. That's what I see all the time. Um, so, yeah. It can push into the thecal sac and cause trouble. In my opinion, get thickening is the problem. Uh, let's see. Yep, for reasons unknown, some people it gets crazy, crazy thick, and it crushes the thecal sac, and it crushes the epidural venous plexus, which surrounds the thecal sac. 
This, this is the drainage system of your nerve roots, like your spinal nerve and your motor root and your sensory root. When you go out for a run or go exercise, you know you're, you're exercising your muscles, but you're exercising your nerves as well. Your nerves are working and firing and waste products are building up. That waste has to be removed. And what removes it is this epidural venous plexus. What happens if this is pinched and not working? You're not going to be able to remove the wastes from your nerves. And the wastes are going to build up. And you're going to start to get pain and start to get weakness in the muscles that those nerves go to, namely your legs. And that's got a name. That's called claudication will develop. Here's a really fresh cadaver uh, of a cut through the disc. Here's the disc. Here's the facet joints, really nice looking facet joints, but here's a ligamentum flavum that is way bigger than two millimeters. Two millimeters is just this little white piece right here. That's probably, what, five, six, seven, eight millimeters here, and that's too big. The, th the spinal canal is squished into this little triangle, so that's moderate to severe central stenosis. The disc is bulging as well. And so that's a common thing that you run into. Pretty hard to fix that. Uh, let's see. So that's central stenosis. That's an example of central stenosis right there. And uh, the classic symptom, your brain should go central stenosis. Your brain should say, oh, everything's pinched right here. Oh, I can't, you can't drain the nerves when they're, when they're walking. So they have problems walking. And they have that problem with walking has a specific name. And here's a forever term right here. Neurogenic intermittent claudication or NIC. Um, and there's another one. It's called vascular intermittent claudication. We'll talk about it in fifth quarter. But NIC is from central stenosis. And so basically those, those veins can't drain the nerves and the nerves are becoming symptomatic because of that. Patients get cramping. They say they're walking in cement. And there's an epidural venous plexus. We already talked about all this stuff right here. Wastes and acids build up, uh, and they cause injuries to the nerve roots. Here's an overhead view of that epidural venous plexus. And that gets crushed by ligamentum flavum getting out of control. Um, there are three factors to this spinal stenosis, ligamentum flavum thickening, disc bulging. And another one, did, did we go over degenerative spondylolisthesis? I think we talked about it. Uh, that can complicate. You get these three things, your patient's going to, and they're at two levels uh, or more, they're going to have claudication. They're not going to be able to walk. Here is a cadaver uh, cut, axial cut through the facet joints, just to show you what arthritis looks like way way too big it's crazy too much bone formation here and look at the z joint itself it's called rat bite erosion like a rat has gotten in here and just been gnawing away it's not smooth like it's supposed to guaranteed this person had back pain and then ligamentum flavum is too big that's all ligamentum flavum it's supposed to be five millimeters which is would be just a little piece here right here so severe osteoarthritis, you could call that facet joint hypertrophy as well if you wanted. One case study, we're out of here. So 60-year-old man complains of bilateral lower extremity pain, heaviness after walking for more than four blocks. Doc, I used to be able to walk a mile with my wife every morning. Then a couple years ago, it was down to half a mile. Now I can only walk four blocks. But if I bring a little folding chair, a lightweight folding chair, after about four blocks, and I pop it open, and I sit down, and I bend forward for about five minutes, I can get up and walk another four blocks. And I could do that again and again and again. What's going on there? What is sitting down, bending forward doing? What's magic about that? If the nerves need to be drained, uh, then bending forward increases the vertebral canal size. So it opens up the, ve the epidural venous plexus and lets the waste products be drained out of the nerves symptoms go away. He stands up, the vertebral canal narrows, and now he's, same thing happens, and he has to repeat that over and over. Or, or wait, before I get to that, examination findings, Kemp's test, so bending backwards into the side is terrible. Uh, that narrows the canal even more, 
So that will usually cause symptoms. He also says when he likes to go shopping at Costco with his wife because he can lean forward over the grocery cart, which opens up the vertebral canal and gives that epidural venous plexus a little room to work. And he can walk for sometimes an hour, even more like that. You'll see these people at Costco now that you start looking for them. Question? Uh, when you're saying nerve drainage, what exactly do you mean by that? Uh, nerve, when the nerves, the nerves exercise, waste products build up, lactic acid builds up inside the nerve roots, mm -hmm. that has to be drained. Okay. And the way it's drained through is through these guys right here, through the veins, okay. the epidural venous plexus. If these are pinched shut in the back because of spinal stenosis, because of ligament and flavor thickening, you can't drain anything. The acid just starts to burn and irritate the nerves, and you start to get pain and dysfunction. But if you stop, bend forward, and open these back up, they work again. They drain off the nerve. That's the theory anyway. Good question. All right, so watch out for these guys when you go to Costco. So we got an MRI. <laughs> You'll see them now. You, I know you've probably seen them already, and it's popping your light bulbs. You go, you know what? I remember seeing somebody like that. Are they, why, you, I guarantee you'll see those. Before you leave the school, you'll see live examples of this now. And when you see that, you think, they got stenosis. That epidural venous plexus, is, it's, it's crushed. Um, yep, that's, that's got a name. That's called shopping cart sign. So look out for shopping cart sign. We got an MRI. Here's to warm you up. Does that look okay? Yeah, that looks great. There's, there's the fecal sac. That's all cerebral spinal fluid. Plenty of room. This is just an example to remind you what normal looks like. Ligamentum flavum is here. Maybe a little, little bit thickened, but still got plenty of room. Now let's see this patient. Now what do you think? Look over here. There's like no, it's, it's like there's not even any cerebral spinal fluid in it. It's completely crushed. Ligamentum flavum is just off the hook huge. And this is epidural fat right here, this white. So it's just smashing the fecal sac into a little ball. And imagine there's epidural venous plexus hanging out in there. It's crushed. There's no way it can do anything. So no wonder. Now, surgically, they go in there, they do a decompression, they take out ligamentum flavum, they might have to kind of shave off some of the bony facets, and they make more room for this thing, and sometimes it works pretty good if it hasn't been going on forever. This patient has all kinds of trouble. To lay. What's this thing? That's a huge herniated disc. So on top of this, they had a disc herniation. What do you think of the color of that? See what I mean by being kind of more light in color? This thing will reabsorb. It's got a really good chance of naturally reabsorbing. They didn't have any, any signs of sciatica because it's in this little safe cubby hole right here. These typically break off and they go in this little cubby hole and get reabsorbed. And people don't need surgery oftentimes if it hangs out there. But yeah, so guarantee you'll run into that. Just another picture, a cadaver picture. Crazy huge ligamentum flavum uh, right here with a bulging disc. All right, you better watch out for this one. It's my favorite bird. Very hard to shoot. Did I show you this one yet? I don't think I did. So that's a black oyster catcher over at Monterey Bay we got a couple weekends ago. Actually, last weekend I got another picture. Of them. So they're kind of elusive. You can see them at Monterey Bay Aquarium. But some of them you can see in the wild still. Question? Um, in the upper cervical spine, where it comes across the rear Atlanta, yep. is that a name change? Is that a name change? Or is that its own ligament? It's its own ligament. It's, a, it's really the same ligament. It's just gotten so thin at that point, they have to change the name. But it's really the same thing. Um, but don't call it that. You have to call it the new name, if that makes sense. All right, see you guys. Let's see. Tomorrow is Monday. So we will do, what will we do tomorrow? We will do lab. What else? Do we have a lecture tomorrow? No. No. Okay. All right. Monday schedule. So tomorrow is Monday. Okay, let me see if there's any online questions.